First off, I need to clarify something. I am not the original traveler, although I have adopted his alias to write my account. For those of you who don't know, my predecessor was an unlikely hero, the sole survivor of a botched experiment that went horribly wrong. He risked all to tell his story, whistleblowing on his government employers and their wealthy backers who have achieved the unthinkable, opening portals to parallel universes. Thanks to this man, we now know the truth about the elite's plan to escape to another world. And even more seriously, he revealed the terrible realities of the dangerous civilizations that rule over these alternate Earths. Cruel, warlike and merciless empires who pose a clear and present danger to our own world if and when they develop their own TDP technology. If you haven't heard the Traveler's accounts yet, I suggest you do so before listening any further. Many of you will be wondering what happened to the original Traveler given the sudden end to his accounts. Well, I'm sorry to confirm that the US government finally caught up with him somewhere in Eastern Europe. Our hero disappeared off the grid, and so we can only assume he's either dead or imprisoned in some hellhole blackside prison, which is probably even worse. And so, sadly, Traveler is no more. But his legacy lives on. This is where I come in. You see, I too worked for this top secret project, albeit at a much lower level in security clearance. While my predecessor was down in the guts of the huge underground complex, operating as part of the survey teams deployed through the transdimensional portal, I was topside, working as a lowly intern in the accounts department. In fact, my clearance was so low that I had no idea the project existed. Nor did I know the true purpose of the sprawling complex I worked within. Officially, I was a low-level government employee in a tedious federal job. This is what I was told when I accepted the position. But of course, I'm not totally stupid, so knew there was more to it. After all, my office was located inside a heavily guarded military complex, and we knew there were underground levels where access was restricted. What's more, the complex is located in a very remote part of the country, a thousand miles from my hometown. Still, my employment prospects were slim after college, and as dull as this entry-level position was, the pay and conditions were decent, and I was told there were prospects for promotion. So, that's how it began for me. And I suppose this is where my story would have ended, had it not been for the bizarre and unprecedented events of one fateful night. I was in the office late, working alone to meet a tight deadline. My boss at the time was a real ball buster, and so I'd already gotten used to working unpaid overtime. Frustrating but nothing out of the ordinary. I was sitting at my desk at the spreadsheet on my computer screen whilst struggling to stay focused. I remember diligently typing away on my keyboard when suddenly the power cut out, plunging the windowless office into darkness. The event was disconcerting, but didn't cause me any undue concern. Not at first anyway. Surges and temporary blackouts were actually pretty common in our offices, and this was the third I'd seen in only two weeks of working there. We'd been told to frequently save and back up our work for this very reason. My laptop was on battery power, and so my screen remained illuminated. And so, I sat tight and waited for the emergency lighting to kick in. But, it didn't. Minutes passed, and still nothing. And that's when I started to get worried. Us lowly employees had never received an adequate explanation for these disruptions to the electricity supply. We'd merely been told that power was being diverted downstairs. Of course, this only added to the rumor mill and gossip around the water coolers. It was rather exciting to speculate with my work colleagues during the daylight hours, 
but it was a different prospect when I was stuck here alone, after hours and in darkness. I began feeling increasingly anxious as the light stayed off. And then, the ground started to shake beneath my feet. This was a new one and not something I was prepared for. Was this an earthquake? They weren't common in this part of the country, and I couldn't help but feel if there was a connection to the power surge moments before. I struggled to stand as the floor moved beneath my feet, and I stumbled as my laptop fell from the desk, the screen smashing when it hit the ground. Now the room was shrouded in total darkness. Until suddenly, it wasn't. In an instant, I was blinded by a burst of intense light, so bright that I had to cover my eyes. Then I got hit by a fierce wave of heat, like an unbelievable surge of energy had suddenly popped into existence right in the middle of my little office. At first I feared some kind of flash fire, but the reality was far more terrifying. When I reopened my eyes and regained my composure, I witnessed something which made no logical sense. The wall at the back of the room had opened up to reveal. Well, what I could see was a room almost identical to the one I was in. Except, in this version, the lights were still on. The plaster wall that should have been there had inexplicably disappeared. But the path through the other side wasn't exactly clear. The passageway looked to me like a fluid membrane, a crystal clear wall which stood between me and whatever was on the other side. Was this a dream? Had I fallen and hit my head during the blackout? Perhaps. But it seemed so real. I walked forward, slowly but cautiously, intending to reach out and touch the membrane. Looking back, this was a crazy move, but in that moment, it made sense in my confused brain. But to my surprise and horror, I tipped over some object I missed in the darkness, helplessly falling forward, right into the fluid wall in front of me. All of the air was sucked from my lungs as I became immersed in it. And then there was nothing but black. I awoke some time later, my head throbbing and retinas burning. It took me a moment to regain my wits and lift myself up. I discovered I was inside an office, nearly, but not quite identical to the one I just left. The power was on, and everything looked in order, but my smashed laptop was nowhere to be found. I shook my head in disarray, trying to make sense of all that had happened. The most logical conclusion was that I'd burnt out. I'd been working long hours after all, so perhaps I had hallucinated the whole experience? Either that, or I'd suffer a panic attack and passed out. In any case, I just wanted to get out of there. I needed to rest, and so decided I would deal with this shit in the morning. With some difficulty, I struggled to the door and walked out into the corridor, stumbling along underneath the glaring LED lights. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Clearly, I wasn't in Kansas anymore. And surely, I should have realized something was wrong. But remember, at this point, I had no idea what really went on within the facility and couldn't have imagined what I'd just been through. And the office complex did appear much the same as I would have expected. There were a couple of details different from how I remembered. The odd thing, like a water cooler or a desk out of place. But I wrote off these discrepancies, telling myself I was just tired and my mind was playing tricks on me. Soon, I reached the security checkpoint in front of the exit. I didn't recognize the armed guard sitting behind the desk. A burly and disinterested middle-aged man who didn't bother looking up from his phone when I walked by. I approached the sealed door and swiped the security card I carried in a lanyard around my neck. It didn't work. The door didn't swing open, but instead there was a beep followed by a red light. 
I tried again, four or five times, but the result was always the same. Frustrated, I turned back to the desk and sought to gain the attention of the board guard. Excuse me, sir? I interjected. My card isn't working. He looked up in annoyance, rolling his eyes as he slammed down his phone and loudly typed into his keyboard. Name? He demanded abruptly. I told him, and he aggressively typed the details into his computer, frowning in annoyance when he didn't get the information he wanted. He looked up at me for the first time, his eyes bloodshot and unfocused. Are you new? He demanded. Uh, I've worked here for two weeks. I answered in confusion. The guard shook his head in annoyance. Damn this system. Those morons in IT can't sort out the glitches. He slammed his fist on a button located under the desk, and the door automatically swung open. Go ahead, he ordered. Thanks, man, I replied meekly before walking out. I eagerly embraced the cool but fresh air when I stepped outside. To my surprise, I saw it was now dawn, with the sun rising on the far horizon. How could this be possible? I couldn't account for the lost time. I didn't want to think about it, however. All I wanted was to get to bed and put my head down. I didn't have accommodation or even a parking space on site, but our employers provided a free shuttle service into the nearby town where I was staying. I boarded the bus, saying good morning to a surly driver who barely acknowledged my presence. I was the only passenger. During the journey, I looked at my phone and discovered I had no signal. Great, I thought. This day was going from bad to worse. Although, of course, I still had no idea of what lay ahead. We arrived in town, and I disembarked, strolling along Main Street as the morning sun shone down upon me. Listeners of the original traveler's accounts may recall his description of this small settlement located about 10 miles from the facility. It's a two-bit little town, which could be described as anywhere USA. This wasn't somewhere I would have moved to if it hadn't been for the employment opportunity. I was new to town, so hadn't found a place to rent yet, so for the time being, I was staying at a local motel. A basic but clean and comfortable place a couple of minutes walk from the bus stop. I felt myself lagging as I walked through the parking lot towards my room, fumbling in my pocket for my key and inserting it in the lock. But to my surprise and annoyance, the door didn't open. I saw it was jammed by the latch, which could only be locked from the inside. I noted an unpleasant stench emanating from within, something similar to rotting meat. I looked through the gap into the darkened room, only to be met by a face on the other side. A woman, her eyes bloodshot and skin pale white. I swore I could see dried blood on her chin. Clearly she wasn't pleased to see me, as she snarled and exposed her sharpened teeth. What the fuck do you want? She growled, squinting to see me in the morning sun. Uh, this is my room? I replied in confusion. To hell it is! She shot back. Now get the fuck out of here before I rip your damn throat out. With that threat, she slammed the door shut, leaving me standing on the outside. Whoa! I exclaimed to no one in particular. I couldn't believe she'd been so aggressive and was left shaken by the unpleasant encounter. Fearing I'd made a mistake, I double-checked the door number. Number 23. This was definitely my room. Clearly, there'd been a mistake by the management, and so I resolved to go to the front desk to resolve it. I could tell something was off as soon as I walked into the small reception area of the motel. The space was very similar to how I remembered, but also subtly different. There was a dark and foreboding atmosphere inside, whereas it had previously been friendly and welcoming. I couldn't put my finger on why. 
The only noticeable difference was an odd and disturbing shrine set upon a table in the corner of the room, a collection of photographs and trinkets underneath a Grim Reaper statue, a ceramic model of a roped skeleton holding a scythe. It reminded me of Santa Muerte, the patron of the infamous Mexican death cult. I was sure this shrine hadn't been there before, and it seemed an odd addition to what I thought was a family-friendly motel. Nevertheless, I proceeded to the front desk and rang the bell to get somebody's attention. After a moment's wait, an elderly man emerged from the back office to answer my call. I was somewhat relieved to discover that I recognized the old-timer. He was in fact the motel's owner who had checked me in two weeks earlier. But when I got a closer look at the man, I realized something was off with him. The owner I remembered was friendly and helpful, but this man appeared sullen and hostile, glaring at me with contempt in his eyes and spitting when he spoke. What do you want? He demanded. I could hardly believe how rude he was being and struggled to find the words to respond. I'm a guest here, remember? Room 23. But someone else is in there. You're not a guest here. He shot back without hesitation. I was getting angry now, and so raised my voice in frustration. Excuse me, sir, but you're wrong. You check me in yourself. Like hell I did. You think I'm stupid? He shouted. I would never rent a room to your kind. Whoa, I thought. Your kind? What the hell was this guy's problem? Listen, sir, you have no right to speak to me like this. I exclaimed angrily. I instantly regretted my outburst when I saw the sudden change in the old man's demeanor as his eyes screwed up in rage and he reached under the counter. To my horror, the motel owner pulled out a shotgun, pointing it directly in my face. Get the fuck out of my business, you damn parasite! He yelled in fury. Get out, or I'll blow your fucking head off! I raised my hands defensively, shaking almost uncontrollably as I slowly backed up. Somehow, I reached the door, slowly and carefully opening it, while the owner tracked me with his gun. Once I was out, I ran for my life, not stopping until I was clear of the office. I breathed heavily as I hid behind a bush, trying to regain my composure and make some sense of what had just happened. Why the hell had the old man reacted like that? I didn't know but was determined not to stick around in case he got trigger happy. My plan was to drive back to the facility and report what had occurred here. But, big surprise, I couldn't find my car. It wasn't in the space where I'd left it or anywhere else in the vicinity. By this point, I thought I was losing my mind. None of it made any sense. Was I having a mental breakdown? Or was I the victim of an elaborate scam? There seemed to be only one option left to me. To go to the cops. There wasn't much of a police presence in the small town. But there was a sheriff's office on the main street. So that's where I went. Still in a state of shock, I stumbled into the police station and reported to a uniformed officer on the front desk. A woman in her 30s or 40s with tight back hair and a no-nonsense look etched across her weathered face. The policewoman didn't exactly greet me with enthusiasm, but at least she didn't pull a gun on me, and her address was abrupt, but relatively polite. Yes, sir? How can I help? For a moment, I couldn't think of what to say. Where would I begin after the crazy morning I'd had? Um, I need to report a crime. My car and all my possessions. They've all been stolen. Okay, the woman replied as she calmly typed information into a computer. Your name, sir? She asked. I told her my full name. ID number? This puzzled me. What the hell was up with this town? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Your state allocated ID number, sir. I needed to log your crime report. I was still baffled. I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. Once again, 
My response triggered a response I couldn't comprehend. The policewoman looked up from her monitor, glaring at me with suspicion. She continued to stare me down as she rose from her chair and stepped around the desk, coming to stand only inches from me. Her glare was intense, and I felt intimidated. Then suddenly, she reached out and roughly grabbed my right arm, rolling up the sleeve on my shirt to examine the skin underneath. Hey, what the hell? I objected, although I offered little resistance to the policewoman's firm grasp. A moment later, she repeated the process, ripping the sleeve from my left arm. It seemed she was looking for something she couldn't find. I saw her frowning as she muttered, No barcode. Excuse me? I exclaimed in astonishment. Suddenly, she released me, although her facial expression was still one of concern. Please take a seat, sir. I need to talk with the sheriff. She motioned towards the plastic seats by the entrance. Still confused, I made my way over there and sat down while the cop went into the back office. It's difficult to describe how I felt in that moment, but it would be fair to say the red flags were flying. I sat on the hard-packed chair and scanned my surroundings. There were several posters on display inside the police station, which only added to my confusion and anxiety. One showed a smiling young woman with a needle in her arm. The catch line was, Give blood. It's the law. Puzzled, I moved in closer to examine the small print, which read, It is a legal requirement to donate one unit of blood every four months, unless you are covered by a health exemption order. If you know of anyone in breach of the Blood Collection Act, it is your legal and moral duty to report them to your local law enforcement. The next poster was entitled, Ten Most Wanted, and showed mugshots of a motley collection of men and women of various ages and ethnic backgrounds. The writing underneath read, Terrorists of the so-called Human League, wanted for subversion, sabotage, and murder, one million units reward for information leading to their capture. What the fuck? I mouthed, shaking my head in disbelief. Alarm bells were ringing in my head, and so I made an instant decision, jumping up from my chair and making for the exit. I ran down the pavement for about a block, looking over my shoulder to ensure I wasn't being followed. I was so concerned with what was behind me that I almost collided with a man standing on the sidewalk, resulting in a firm rebuke. Watch it, asshole! He exclaimed, whilst shooting me a hard glare. I apologized to the man noticing that he was standing at the back of a long queue of people, all waiting to gain entrance to what appeared to be a medical facility of some kind. The assembled persons represented a diverse mix of gender, age, and race, but all were waiting impatiently under the morning sun. I noted how their heads were down, and everyone appeared sullen and depressed. There was no conversation in the line, and it seemed nobody wanted to be there. I looked up at the sign above the door, and it read, Department of Human Affairs, Blood Collection Point. I also noted the scrolling neon sign which displayed various messages such as, Complete your civic duty today, give blood, do not delay, and blood donations are mandatory, failure to comply will result in prosecution. I swore under my breath as I read those words. This was the second reference I'd seen to mandatory blood donations. What the hell was this? Had they passed a new law that I wasn't aware of? I continued to stand there on the sidewalk, pondering my next move, when I was startled by a cry behind me. Sir, you need to come with us. I turned my head to see the policewoman from the station, running down the street after me. She was accompanied by a large, bald-headed man in a beige uniform who I guessed was the town's sheriff. While the woman was relatively calm, the sheriff clearly wasn't. He screamed aggressively as he pursued me, pulling a weapon from his holster. Freeze, asshole! Don't you dare run! I didn't flee. In fact, I was frozen in fear, not knowing how to react in that moment. 
I noticed how the people in the street suddenly disappeared, scattering in all directions, as if they knew what was about to happen. Clearly I posed no threat, but this didn't matter to the bullish sheriff as he aimed his weapon and fired. I felt a heavy impact against my chest, and for a moment I was sure I was dead. But instead of a bullet, I got zapped by a taser, a surge of electricity pulsating through my body as I fell down, hitting the pavement with a heavy thud. What happened next is something of a blur in my memory. I recall lying face up on the pavement, still convulsing until the taser was disengaged. Next, they forced me up on my feet, roughly applying handcuffs and throwing a sack over my head, before they bundled me into the back of a vehicle. Why are you doing this to me? I cried in despair. I don't do anything. The response surprised me. It was the woman's voice, and her tone was empathetic. I'm sorry. Please don't fight. A second later, I felt a sharp jab in my neck, making me yelp in pain and shock. Only a few seconds passed before I began to feel woozy, struggling in vain to keep my eyes open, before everything went black. I don't know how long I was out for, but I was awoken with a jolt as freezing cold water was dumped over my head. I yelled out in pain and instinctively tried to jump up, only to discover I was restrained bound by my wrists and ankles to a hard metal chair. My whole body ached as I struggled in vain against the pines and tried to adjust my eyes to this new environment. I found myself inside a dimly lit, small and windowless room with bare concrete walls. Other than the chair I was bound to, the only other piece of furniture was a stainless steel table to my right. I glanced over at it, and... To my horror, saw the table contained a selection of what looked like sterilized surgical instruments. I tried to think what their purpose was. And then, my attention was drawn to the man standing over the table, closely examining what I soon realized were the contents of my wallet. He took the shape of a man at least. But there was something decidedly inhuman about this individual. He looked young probably in his twenties, and may have been Hispanic in origin. The man was undoubtedly handsome, with a firm jawline and fit physique. But his physical appearance was more than intimidating. He was terrifying. I saw his teeth when he opened his mouth, revealing what I can only describe as a pair of fangs. And his eyes, dark green and almost reptilian, there was no way they were human. These were the eyes of a predator, and they were focused on me. The fly caught in his deadly web. He glanced down at my wallet before addressing me in a deep, booming voice. I recall how he read my name and date of birth from my driver's license. That's you, is it? He inquired. I struggled to answer through my quaking lips but managed to whimper a single word reply. Yes. That's funny. He snorted dismissively. Because no one with that name in details exists on the national database. No name, no blood group, and no barcode tattoo on your arm. Which, of course, is mandatory for all humans to have. How do you explain that? I shook my throbbing head still hoping against hope is that I'd awake from this nightmare. I don't understand any of this, I pleaded. Please, contact my employers, and they'll confirm who I am. My captor smiled cruelly before replying. Ah, yes. Your employers. I am very interested in learning about them. Believe me. My mind was racing, and I felt I was going to be physically sick. I don't understand, I repeated. Who are you? What are you? My captor's grin widened, again revealing his crocodile-like teeth. Of course, where are my manners? My name is Dr. Salvatore. I am head of security at this facility, 
executive member of the Vampire Nation Party and proud Homo Nocturnus of the purest blood. I almost laughed aloud, despite the extreme danger I was in. Vampire? I exclaimed in dismay. You mean no sunlight, drinks blood, sleeps in coffin, stake through the heart, and all that shit? Salvatore laughed in open mockery at the description. Ah, yes. The foolish human superstitions from the old days. Such myths were widespread before the revolution, when my kind rose up and took our rightful place in the world, ruling over the weak and pitiful human race. Your blood is no longer necessary for our sustenance, of course. But the ancient tributes are still maintained. Thus, the Blood Collection Act and mandatory quotas. But of course, you already know all this, don't you? I shook my head vigorously, not wanting to believe what I was hearing. I don't know anything. I shouldn't be here. That much is true. Salvatore snarled back. But I already know who you really are. I have long suspected that other worlds would develop their own portal technology and seek to visit our dimension. And now, here you are, in the flesh. But I don't care about a lowly worm like you. What I want to know is who sent you and what is their agenda. I refuse to believe that Homo sapiens would have the intelligence to develop such advanced technology. Surely you are a pawn being used by a more powerful civilization. I suggest you tell the truth now, before I am forced to take more drastic measures. I don't know anything. I repeated in a panic. No one sent me, and I don't know how I got here. Salvatore shook his head, and obviously he was not convinced. Very well. Have it your way, maggot. He spat. I'll get the truth from you, one way or another. To my horror, I saw him reach for one of the sharpened instruments from the table, and an ice-cold chill ran up my spine as I feared what was to come. I don't wish to recount what happened to me over the next few hours. Honestly, I'm still trying to come to terms with the torture I endured at the hands of that monster. Suffice to say, I was beaten, cut, and bled by a psychopath who took a sadistic pleasure from my pain and fear. Clearly he was an expert in torture and thoroughly enjoyed his work. Salvatore kept on asking the same questions. Who are you? What did I know about the project? What was the objective of my mission? I didn't know the answers, of course, but he didn't believe my denials. Either that, or he didn't care. Some of the torture was psychological as well as physical. At one stage, he actually drank my blood in front of me, making a show of spitting it out in disgust. Your blood is that of a low-caste human, he mocked. You are truly inferior and unworthy in all respects. I didn't know whether he was serious or not. My panicked brain tried to think while he inflicted pain upon me. Why was this happening to me? How had I gone to work one day and suddenly emerged in this hellish place? In a world similar and yet so different from my own. And why was this monster torturing me? What the fuck did he want? Clearly my horrific predicament had something to do with the shadowy government department I worked for and the bizarre incident which had occurred in the previous night. I would learn the awful truth later. But right then... I was focused on survival. Mercifully, Salvatore eventually left me alone after what must have been several hours of torture. I'll give you some time to think things over, he said when leaving the room, smirking cruelly as he did so. But don't worry, I'll be back real soon. I was grateful for the respite, but knew he would return to finish the job and I was still bound to the metal chair, weak from blood loss in the beatings. There was no chance I could escape from this torture room, nor could I answer the questions Salvatore was bombarding me with. To be honest, 
By this point, I just wanted to die so that the pain would end. I must have lost consciousness again. Because the next thing I remember is being roughly shaken awake. I groggily opened my eyes, feeling a renewed terror when I recalled where I was. But it wasn't Salvatore who had awoken me. A new figure had entered the room, putting his hands upon me. I instinctively recoiled in fear, expecting yet more pain to be inflicted upon my person. But, to my immense surprise, the man started to undo my pines, whilst whispering comforting words in my ear. It's okay, man. You're okay. We're going to get you out of here, buddy. I looked up to see a friendly face, a young man with dark hair and blue eyes, his expression showing compassion, but also determination. I noticed how he wore some type of uniform, but was somewhat concerned to see a pistol tucked in his waistband. But soon, he had me free, helping me to my feet. I saw the door was ajar, and two more individuals stood on the other side. One male and one female, both dressed the same as my rescuer. Both were armed, with guns drawn and ready for use. I struggled to speak through my bleeding lips, asking, who are you people? We're with the Human League, the leader answered firmly. My mind raced as I tried to remember where I heard that name before. The Human League? Y you're terrorists? I asked. We're freedom fighters, he shot back angrily. Our ancestors have fought these vampire fucks for centuries. Now we're underground, but we keep up the resistance. He looked agitated, staring at the open door and corridor. But there's no time for history lessons. We need to move. I could hardly walk due to my injuries, so the two men supported me while the woman took point. We soon reached an elevator, which the leader needed to key in a coat to summon. When we got into the lift, we descended for what seemed like an eternity, down to the lowest level of the facility. I was still disoriented and baffled by this sudden turn of events. Why are you people helping me? The leader nodded, he said solemnly. It's a good question. We've worked for years to infiltrate this facility, and now our cover will be blown. But when we heard about you, the decision was taken to help you escape. If we get you home, you can tell your people the truth of what's happening on our world. And maybe, just maybe, They'll come to our aid. I still didn't fully understand what he meant, but did feel a renewed hope at the prospect of getting home. And I certainly wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth. Finally, we reached the lowest level of the facility and exited the elevator, speeding down yet more corridors before reaching a steel security door, which the rebel leader opened by keying in another code and going through what looked like a retinal scan. He was satisfied at hearing the beep, as the heavy door automatically swung open. We then entered a huge underground chamber, adorned with control panels and high-tech equipment, the purpose of which was beyond my comprehension. I did note the huge, spiral-like device facing the back wall, easily thirty foot long and dominating the room. Again, I had no idea what this device was used for, but the whole scene conjured images in my head of science fiction scenarios and of secret, dark experiments conducted by shadowy organizations. I found it difficult to take in my surroundings, however, as I was still weak from the blood loss, and so grateful when they sat me down on a swivel chair to rest. Cover the door! We don't have much time! That was the leader, shouting orders to his two subordinates. They drew their weapons and stood guard, while the leader quickly but carefully worked away at the control panels, bringing systems to life with the touch of various buttons and switches. I watched on, awestruck as power surged and the spiral device started to spin. Slowly at first, but quickly gaining momentum. The chamber was suddenly filled up by a cacophony of sounds and illuminated by an intense light. I started to panic, fearing an explosion. But the rebel leader seemed to know what he was doing 
As he continued, the mysterious process had begun. Suddenly, there was a commotion back at the entrance as the security door slowly swung open to reveal a squad of black clad troops, all armed with submachine guns. Here they come, came the cry. Hold them off, just two more minutes. I heard the first shot and saw the lead trooper scream and fall. A split second later, the chamber was filled with gunshots as bullets flew in all directions. I covered my ears and ducked as a fresh terror overcame me. There seemed to be no way out of this chamber, and I couldn't see any sort of plan. But the rebel leader continued to work frantically at his computer terminal, ignoring the mayhem occurring all around him. From my hiding place, I could see the rebel soldiers fighting fiercely, but they were heavily outnumbered and outgunned, so the outcome seemed inevitable. To my horror, I saw a bullet ricochet and strike the male rebel in the head, blowing his brains all over the floor. A moment later, the woman attempted to fall back, but was struck by a burst of automatic fire, falling with a cry as her life was abruptly ended. Now, there was nothing standing between us and the trigger-happy security team. In a panic, I turned to the leader and saw he had finished his work, now drawing his pistol and joining the fight. It's starting! Get ready to move! I wanted to ask what the hell he meant. But a moment later, the gunfire started over. I continued to cower, until suddenly... The chamber was filled with a blinding light, temporarily pausing the gun battle as an unimaginable power surged through the facility, making the ground shake beneath our feet. I looked to the far wall and experienced deja vu as I saw a familiar fluid membrane suddenly appear, and on the other side was a chamber virtually identical to the one I occupied. Suddenly, it all made sense, and I finally understood. What the hell are you doing? Get going before it closes! That was the rebel leader again, as he temporarily ceased fire to scream his order. I was horrified to see a sudden sharp movement. A figure moving quicker than I thought possible, and heading straight for the surviving rebel. I tried to shout out a warning, but it was already too late. The figure grabbed the rebel with immense speed and strength, knocking the gun out of his hand before plunging its fangs into his neck. I stood paralyzed by fear and consumed by horror as I watched my savior's blood spill all over the concrete floor. And. It got worse. The monster who had slaughtered the man was Salvatore. My torturer had come to reclaim his victim. He glared at me with predatory eyes and fresh blood still dripping from his mouth. And I broke from my paralyzed state, turning and running the only place I could, through the portal and towards the world existing on the far side. I heard a bloodthirsty roar and heavy footfall and I knew Salvatore was chasing me down. I leapt the last few steps, practically diving through the portal with that monster only inches behind me. Next, I was consumed by darkness, falling into a hellish abyss which was only slightly less terrifying than the nightmare I'd escaped from. A moment later, I shot out the other side, my body hitting the steel walkway heavily. I felt pain all over, struggling to move as I turned on my back. To my immense relief, I saw the portal close, shutting Salvatore and his gunmen on the other side. The moments which followed were chaotic as men shouted and people ran to my side. At this point, my strength failed me, and I blacked out once again, not knowing whether I would wake up. But realizing, I had at least escaped the clutches of that monster. The days and weeks which followed didn't get much easier. Obviously, I survived and was treated for my injuries within the facility. But I wasn't even fully recovered when they first came to speak with me. Anonymous men in black suits who bombarded me with questions. Thankfully, they didn't torture me like Salvatore had. But nevertheless, their questioning was relentless 
as they sought to establish every tiny detail of my misadventure. They told me very little in return, but I managed to piece things together from the information I had. The facility I worked at was virtually a mirror image of the one on the other side. A secret base experimenting in TDP technology. I never should have been a part of this experiment, but something went seriously wrong. On the night I crossed over, there had been a test down below, but the stabilization field had failed, resulting in what they called a cascade event. An unplanned portal had opened up in my office, and I had been unlucky enough to follow through it, ending up in a hellish alternate dimension without any of the knowledge, skills, or tools I needed. The fact that I had survived and made it home was entirely down to the Human League rebels, who'd sacrificed their lives to save me. To my shame, I'd never even asked their names. I told my interrogators all about this, of course, practically begging them to send help to the beleaguered humans on that vampire-controlled world. But, I could tell, they have no intention of doing so. Eventually, they let me go, paying me severance for my job and warning me not to speak about what happened, quoting federal law and threatening a lengthy prison sentence if I broke my silence. Obviously, I've decided to talk in spite of the threats, inspired by the courageous example set by my predecessor and the ultimate sacrifice made by the freedom fighters who saved my life. Now, I'm on the run having taken steps to hide and conceal my identity. Maybe I'll stay lucky and escape their net. Or perhaps not. Either way, my story is out there. Enough done my part. But I'm not the last whistleblower who wants to tell the truth. Others will take up the traveler mantle. And in time... We will take down this nefarious project and the shadowy figures running it. Until then, stay safe, friends. And keep on listening. <laughs>